we've been hearing a lot about uh, both two things, the, uh, what the problem is and what some of the solutions are. And at this stage of the game today, uh, you, the audience, has an option to either accelerate a discussion about what the solutions are for the human that is, has been exposed to these particles, or if you want to go into more depth sooner than tomorrow about exactly how many cancers each year in the United States, for example, is being caused by this radiation in the, in the background and what, um, where the sources of that radiation comes from. Those who want the solutions ahead of knowing what the full problems are with the human being, would you raise your hands? Okay, and those who want to know the full extent of the radiation problem and its causation to cancer, would you raise your hand? You can't vote twice. It's related, no, not just to cancer, but with uh, all the chronic degenerative diseases. So it looks like uh, the, the solution's coming first, is what you want? You, oh, let's do it one more time. Uh, who want to know the radiation problems first? Okay, that's about half the room. And the other, uh, for those who want to know the human solutions, it's 50-50. Yeah, who's, is there anyone? Yeah, is, is everyone going to be here tomorrow? Okay, all right, so I guess it's my call now. All right, we'll just let it stay then the way it is. Uh, there we go. Look, I, I have a logistical question. Yes. Uh, this morning the building was closed until 10 because it was not the weekday. Yes, and what happens tomorrow? So tomorrow Sunday, not being the weekday, can we not begin until 10? <laughs> George, what do you think? What, what did that say again? We couldn't get in the building today until 10 because the doors were locked. Is that going to happen tomorrow? No, we'll get in, get in on time tomorrow. We will? We're here at 645. No, but the building was locked until 10. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, we, if we have doors, if you open up to anybody who helps tomorrow, just so you know, if you keep the door open more than a minute, the alarms will sound. But if you only keep the door open for a moment, let someone in and then let them close, the alarms will not sound. So just so you know. Uh, the schedule is on the website, I believe. Uh, uh, it does start at 9? Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to try to make up for lost time then with uh, this section. Uh, normally, we would go to uh, 445. Uh, go up on your toes a little bit more before we sit down again, okay? So we can get some blood to the good old brain. And could I have a volunteer for someone to sit right here to push my buttons? Oh, David will. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I guess just the arrow down will work. All right. All right, everyone, let's get going again. Thank you. All right, what we're going to talk about is the, thank you, the, the dirty little secret about exactly how much cancer is being caused here in this country. Is that right? A little bit more? With the radiation exposure that we have, both from natural background or norm, as David put it, plus man-made put together. They are about 50-50. We're getting half from man-made sources of radiation, including accidents like Fukushima, and the other half from natural background. Texas has a lot of areas that do not have very much natural background radiation because there isn't very much radon or uranium in the ground around here. So that gas of radioactive radon is not commonly seen here in the state. But in, very other part, in many other parts of the country it is, especially around where they're mining a lot of coal. All right, um, David, next slide, please. Oh, pu push the arrow down. Just the, the yeah, mm -hmm. very good. All right, so according to the National Academies or National Academy of Sciences, What we're seeing is, is a, an acceptance of the truth by only one governmental agency, that being the National Academy of Sciences, that there is absolutely, as I stated earlier, no safe level of radiation. So when someone says, oh, that's within permissible li limits, 
That's within normal background limits, so don't worry about it. They're making up a, a wild tail. And as I said earlier, additional amounts of radiation are cumulative. If the plutonium that's still floating around in the stratosphere st suddenly starts coming down today that became airborne in 1954, that adds considerably to the radiation going on now. And once it's inside the body, it continues to emit ionizing radiation that produces burning chemicals like hydrogen peroxide. That's where most of the damage comes from. Now, there is an upward dose limit, which is subject to changing if there's an accident. They're arbitrarily, in, in Japan, for example, going to be raising the limit that's the upper dose limit, simply because the dose is too high and they have no other choice. And of course, they picked 100 milligram per year per person as the upper dose limit, because that was as low as they could get it. If they already know that any amount is not safe, they tried to do their best to keep it as low as possible. But the irony is, is that we're already getting 624 milligrams per person per year in the United States. At 311 million people exposed to 624 milligram annually, that will generate 200,000 cases of cancer per year. So what do you think would happen if that rate doubles of milligram exposures? Do you think that the cancer rate is necessarily going to increase, maybe even double? Given enough time, it would double. But it takes a while for that new added radiation that might be hitting an area such as the West Coast from the Fukushima fallout, even if those levels are double, to be able to catch up and, and generate enough cancers. So the confusing part of how to word this from the officials is, well, let's only talk about a one-time dose which will cause cancer versus an everyday low-dose exposure that over the course of a year and eventually over the course of a decade will also cause cancers. They don't like to talk about the last part, if ever. They like to talk about that it takes about 150 rem, not millirem, but rem, on up to 450 milliram, uh, rem, excuse me, just regular rem, to be able to cause instantaneous damage to the human body. That's a one-time dose just for a few moments, such as some of the things that we saw with the sailors on board the USS Ronald Reagan. They were exposed to very, very high levels over about a two-week time period. What we're talking about here is different. We're talking about relatively low levels, one thousandth of a rem, and 624 of them over a year that generates 200,000 cancers per year in the United States. Now, I don't know exactly the number of new cancers that we get here in the United States, but I can guarantee you that's a lot, that's a big portion of it. In addition to that, I said earlier that low-grade radiation levels in the body will accelerate or amplify all other known causes of cancer, to my knowledge, at least tenfold. So even if the radiation in the body is maybe added another 10 millirems or another 50 millirems, that's contributing to amplifying the toxicity of other things already in the body that over a period of 20 years or 15 years or 10 years would on its own cause cancer. It's just been accelerated. Okay, next slide, please. This is what I just stated earlier, that according to the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements, that half of the radiation that we're exposed to each year is from man-made, and the other half is natural. Next slide, please. So of the background radiation and of the man-made radiation that was pre-Fukushima, we were getting about 100,000 new cases of cancer, and together it was 200,000 cases of cancer. So after Fukushima, what is the current reported radiation level for, for Austin, Texas? And what we saw on the 20th of March was that we were getting 173 counts per minute. That's on a Geiger counter. How many hits on the probe of the Geiger counter was being struck by decaying radioactive elements. And 
173 CPM if it occurred every single day for a year would mean that everyone in Austin or around that area where it was measured in Austin would receive 1,516 milligrams per person per year. Now we just jumped from 624 milligram, which causes 200,000 cases of cancer each year, according to the National Academy of Sciences. And now we're reporting 173 counts per minute in Austin that just by itself will add, if it occurred every day for a year, an extra 1,550, uh, 16 millirems per person per year. Now here's where it gets confusing even to me. We don't know what the National Academy of Sciences was referring to when they said that the average American gets 624 millirems of radiation. Were they using the same kind of Geiger counter that was used on March 20th just a few days ago here in Austin. Because each Geiger counter can be programmed according to its probe and its sensitivity to cover either a smaller or a greater range of radioactive substances that are in the immediate environment. So we have to make some assumptions here to, be, to remain scientific. The statement would be accurate if it's worded exactly this way. If the accuracy of the radi radiation detectors before F Fukushima occurred and were the ones that the National Academies based their projection of how many cancers per year are caused were the same accuracy and had the same spectrum of coverage of radioactive particles that are being used right at this moment in Austin, then indeed we are actually seeing a troubling of the current cancer rates caused by man-made radiation or um, approximately 200,000 additional can uh, cancers in the United States per year if the entire nation were receiving that every single day for a year. And it wouldn't happen right away. It would, again, it takes a while for that level to start kicking in that higher cancer rate, but eventually it would plateau at that level. Now this begins to answer the question, why in God's earth are we constantly seeing an increase in cancer rates? There has only been but one year out of the last 60 that we saw a drop in the annual cancer rates in this country. We've been heading up and up and up and up in the, in the, in the numbers of new cancers each year. And as I said earlier, in 1950, we were the number one healthiest developed nation in the world. And as soon as above-ground nuclear testing began, we started going way downhill. As soon as the above-ground nuclear testing went offline, we, get, we again started uh, making some improvements in, in the nation's health, especially in chronic illnesses. And as soon as the nuclear power plants were turned on in the early 70s, that decline started again, where we became less and less healthy as a nation. As soon as a nuclear power plant is turned off, that region within 100 miles in diameter around a nuclear power plant, all the st health stats start improving again. That's been published in the peer review. Next slide, please. This is what I showed you earlier about the mysterious spikes that are hitting Hawaii. Just to show you that 173 CPM in Austin is not unusual for states like Hawaii, but this website that has 3,000 volunteers across the country on average since a year and a half ago has been recording many, many daily readings of CPMs, counts per minute, in excess of 150 to 200 counts per minute. If the published norm used to be between 10 and at the highest 100 CPM, and now we're seeing a new norm of 150 CPM to 300 CPM. What the heck is going on? Well, either the detectors are different or the detectors are the same and we have more coming in from Fukushima. Now, I have spoken to experts who do this for a living, who work at universities, 
And over the past three years, they saw a huge spike that initially increased because of Fukushima, and then they sh showed a plateauing that took place after that. Whether or not that went back down to pre-Fukushima or not depends on the day. But the levels are much lower than when Fukushima happened. It takes six days when there is an eruption of radioactive fallout or gas that arises from Fukushima for it to hit the west coast. Another three days for it to fly all over the US and hit the east coast. So after nine days of something happened at Fukushima, we can expect radiation to be above the air on the east coast of the United States. And depending upon if there's rainfall or not, it may be hitting an area. That's the reason why Philadelphia suffered the worst increase in infant death rate of any other part in America, not because they were on the west coast, but because they received the most rainfall during that time period. All right, next slide, please. Now, this is the National Geological Survey that I referred to earlier. And notice in Southern California, it has the biggest red dot. This survey um, was unaware of my study done in the southern part of Washington, just above Portland, where our particles of radiation greatly exceeded that in Southern California. So I am sure that there were many, many areas along the west coast of the United States not being marked on here that actually received a great deal of radiation that's now going into the food, food chain. And once it goes into the food chain, as uh, David in, implied, uh, number one, it doesn't ever leave. It's active for well over 300 years. And it will only magnify and concentrate up the food chain until we eat it like the bluefin, bluefin tuna. Uh, by the way, uh, there's recent publications that 70, over 70% 70 of the fish coming in from the Pacific Ocean from certain fleets and fleets of ships from different nations go all over the Pacific. They, they don't fish in any one area. They just follow where the fish go. 70% have enormous, unacceptable levels of cesium-134 and 137 in there. So until further notice, I suggest that no one consume North Pacific seafood. North Pacific seafood should be out unless you really know what you're doing to pull it out of your system. Next slide, please. OK, what is it that we're talking about? We talked a little bit about cesium. There was some strontium, plutonium, and uranium mentioned. But no one talked about hydrogen or radioactive hydrogen called tritium. We talked a little bit about iodine. There are really 30 of these different elements. These are the top five really the top six. And the initial wave that comes in is that we see spikes in infant death rates when the iodine hits the thyroid gland because it shuts it down. And the immune system cannot handle normal colds and viruses, especially in the young and the very old. That's the reason why the spikes in infant death rates went sky high. We also eventually see uh, increases in cancer we eventually will see increases in chronic degenerative diseases. Like I said, in 1950, we were all getting better here in the United States in these figures. As soon as the above ground bomb testing occurred, everything started going in the wrong direction. We also see premature deaths, people not living as long, or they have to be super medicated. Does, there, does anyone know here what the average American, at the, if, he, if he or she was 45 years of age in 1900, if they were 45 years of age in 1900, what was their expected lifespan? Those of you who think it was 60, raise your hand. Okay? Those of you who think that 45-year-old could be expected to live to 65, raise your hand. Okay? Those of you who would say that that person could be expected to live to 70, raise your hand. 75? Okay, what about 80? Okay. If you were 45 years of age in 1900, you could expect to live very close to 80 years of age, except you didn't die of all these chronic degenerative diseases. You just didn't wake up one morning. That is marked down on a death certificate as death from natural causes, not from heart attack, not from cancer, not from any other known disease, natural causes. We're not seeing that anymore today. The reason why that everyone says, oh, we live a lot longer today is because we had a very high infant death rate in 1900. That's averaged in to all those people that lived extra long. So we came up with this average that, oh, we only lived approximately on average to 45 years of age 
back in 1900. That's bogus. We just had a higher infant death rate back then. By the way, our infant death rate is now starting to go sky high again. We're now 17th in the world in infant death rate. So these lifelong crippling disabilities start about the age of 45, 50. We have an organ removed. We have all these medications. And we live a life of misery the last 20 years of our retirement. We might live to 76, but we sure aren't living like the 45-year-old did to 76 back in 1900. They worked every single day. They were healthy. They didn't even start their aging process in full until the last several years of life, contrary to all of the medications that we have to take as we're enter into the, our sixth dec decade here. Next uh, slide, please. All right, so the first thing that happens when this iodine hits the infants and hits the children and hits the fetuses, that iodine radioactive will permanently destroy parts of that thyroid gland. There will be no recovery outside of regenerative medicine, which makes it possible, but hardly ever done. So once the damage occurs, now how many humans were exposed to the fallout from the above ground bomb testing starting in 1952 through about 1962. We're talking about millions of Americans, millions. And if you sign up for my next newsletter, we'll have beautiful maps that the National Cancer Institute put out in the, in the 1990s after a 10 year delay of not wanting to tell everyone what was really happening. That low thyroid situation sets up all chronic degenerative diseases, including cancer. Thyroid gland and its hormone is the most essential hormone. It's like oxygen. Everything else, all the other hormones and everything else we make aren't made enough without sufficient amounts of iodine. Now let me ask you a question. The testing for thyroid used to be taking the temperature underneath your arm first thing in the morning before you wake up. That was put together by Broda Barnes, MD, PhD. He compared it to metabolic chambers he had to lay in for six hours where he measured the amount of carbon dioxide you exhaled, the amount of oxygen that you consumed, your body temperature, and so on and so forth. And he found out that by simply taking your temperature underneath your arm first thing in the morning before getting out of bed, it was every bit as accurate as these basal metabolic chambers. They didn't have blood work back then. He found that at 98.0 under the arm, it's normal, it's ideal. Plus or minus 0.2 is okay. Anything above it, there's something going on. Anything below it, you can be in real trouble. For example, if your metabolism is down to 97 degrees, 0, 97, that's about a degree lower, your metabolism has turned off by 2,000%. If your enzyme systems need that 98 degrees to keep the immune system working, and it's working 2,000% less, another way of saying that, if you're already at 97.0 and you increase your body temperature to normal at 98.0, first thing in the morning under the arm, your metabolism has increased by 2,000%. So I'm saying it in reverse. Imagine why that all these chronic illnesses that we don't recover from are occurring. Our metabolisms just aren't there. Well, you say we should be able to catch this at the doctor's office with blood work. No. The blood work came in the late 50s with all these kids who were exposed to radioactive iodine from above ground testing, and they got the wrong normal. How, is, how are normals determined? You take a bunch of college kids, say, hey, listen, we're doing an investigation. We'll give you some bucks off of your tuition. Would you please come in? Take your blood. Find out what their thyroid levels are in the bloodstream. That's got to be healthy normal. It wasn't. It wasn't. Those body temperatures don't fool anyone. If those kids came in at 97.0, look at all the kids that are overweight today. I guarantee you that you're not going to be able to throw off weight by dieting if your metabolism is 2,000% slower than it should be. You might starve yourself to death. But until you get your metabolism on up to where it needs to be, you can't throw that excess fat off. This is a result, in my opinion, of this darn radioactive iodine that's gotten into the system. The iodine will cause its effect within 90 days, and then it breaks down into harmless iodine. But that's all it takes. It takes a one-time exposure to permanently damage the thyroid gland. 
If you're living around a nuclear power plant, we'll see in a minute, you're getting radioactive iodine on a regular basis. There is no safe level of radioactive anything, according to the National Academy of Sciences. So every time you hear these officials say, oh, don't worry about it, it's diluted, it's below normal background levels, or a dental x-ray, now you know. These people aren't telling you the truth. Next slide, please. This gives you some numbers in comparison to Chernobyl. We do know that Chernobyl released over 30 different kinds of radioactive elements. Uh, the strontium and the cesium are the ones that linger around the longest besides plutonium. Plutonium is 25,000 years, 250,000 years altogether. So we'll just stick to the cesium and strontium. It's easier to put our arms around it. According to the World Health Organization, Chernobyl released about 22 kilograms. That's about 50 pounds of cesium into the environment. At Fukushima, it's likely that there's 100 times the amount of cesium that's been released. Now, we know three times as much release uh, at Fukushima, uh, Chernobyl has already occurred into the Pacific Ocean. That's been actually measured, as I said. What no one has accurately been able to track yet is the measurements in the air and how much hit the US and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. This is what I just stated. This was released last summer. Uh, actually, uh, the, the, the data was stopped last summer being collected and it was reported in September of 2013. Three times. I predicted that there would be seven times the release in my book at the end of 2011 seven times the amount. Why? Because there was seven times as much fuel. I predicted that the fuel was not completely melted down like we know it is now. We know the fuel is completely melted down in units one, two, and three. We don't know how much has been melted down in unit four yet. But I gave some conservative numbers for units one, two, and three, both the storage fuel pools that were there as well as the vessel where the reaction was taking place. And it still came out to be seven times that was released at, at Chernobyl. And again, there's two places it can go, into the water, underground table, or into the air. It can collide and bond to things like metal. So hopefully a lot of the cesium is bound to the inside of the containment buildings. I doubt it because the temperature was just too high. Where this will go is into the seaweed because seaweed is like a magnet. It's like pectin is and zeolite. It just loves things that are heavy particles and radioactive, which could be used to harvest out the radiation from different places around the West Coast. Not very practical, though, I think, in the long run. 75% of the operational U.S. nuclear power plants continue to leak radioactive hydrogen. Now, hydrogen goes mostly into the water table. It has a long half-life. And it combines with everything. It goes right into the plants, right into the wor earthworms, right into the birds that eat it. And this is cumulative. Every bit of release of tritium starts another cycle of the birds eating it from the earthworms. And it just keeps on building and building and building and building. And then the other thing it does, it helps to mutate germs. The Nobel Prize winners that got the United States to quit testing above ground that Helen Caldicott will be with us tomorrow. She was one of the Nobel Prize winners, member of that team. This is one thing that they predicted. They said, we won't even know that the germ has been mutated by these so-called low levels of radiation because there's no way to track it. But it will occur. And because our immune systems have never seen it before, it'll cause little tiny mini epidemics. Now, we're seeing this bizarre thing occur in California right now that looks just like polio. The Yakima is another thing, but we're seeing this weird virus-like newbie. We're also seeing it. I just treated a patient who was, uh, he was a Marine. He had it in his heart, almost killed him. And so I knew exactly what to do with him and pulled him out of his spot. He, uh, he was on the list for a heart transplant. He got it because he was jogging five miles a day uh, just near somebody that coughed on him as he was jogging by. Where does that come from? Does it link back to this? I think it does, but... It's not a scientific, credible statement for, dis, for to say conclusively or not. I like to listen to past Nobel Prize winners, though. 
I think they're pretty smart people. 25% of all U.S. nuclear power plants are at risk from dam rupturing and flooding, just like at, at Fukushima. Now, Dr. Klein said that there was about four to six nuclear reactors here in the U.S. that was like uh, Fukushima, right, the, the boiling reactors. Well, I, I would like to understand that statement because the Nuclear Regulatory Agency uh, Commission in, in the mid-1980s, 1985, in front of Senate testimony said that with the current plants, it still are the ones running today, with the same design from General Electric. General Electric designed these. They designed Fukushima. They built Fukushima. We can expect every 25 years for there to be a complete failure, including all the safety backup systems. I tell you, that's hard to dig out that statement. I had to dig and dig and dig until I found it. But that is a true statement. Did, did everyone hear what, I, what that? OK. We have. I'm sorry? No, no, this, this is Nuclear Regulatory Commission testimony before the U.S. Senate. Okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Senator Markey, is that his name, from uh, Massachusetts? Senator Markey, yeah, that was in front of his panel, 1985. He was, they, they, the NRC was asked, uh, about on average, how long would you think it would be for a complete meltdown failure to occur at a new U.S. nuclear power plant? And the, state, and the answer came back was, we expect one every 25 years. Well, fortunately, they're starting to shut down these plants because the piping systems are cracking from what he was talking about with the neutrons. They can't possibly repair all the plumbing. It's so full of weakening and cracking that, that's why San Onofre was finally shut down. They tried everything to repair it, and they couldn't do it. That's what's happening to our aging fleet of 104 operational nuclear power plants. You can't, we don't have the technology to deal with that. And yet they continue to build these so-called third and fourth generation nuclear reactors. It's just a fancy term for saying we've improved it a little bit, but not enough. But enough to promote it so we can get are our next two plants built in Georgia, which has just been licensed and going on. Next, next slide, please. Now, this is the scary part to me when I saw this. This is stu the study done on 400 different nuclear power plants across the world, done by Korblin. And he showed that if the child was five or under and they lived within five miles of a nuclear power plant, their risk of leukemia jumped by up to 220%. Why? Because of the iodine, because of the tritium. Another thing that was determined, this is another scandalous thing that happened. I, I, I can't believe that the American public uh, missed this. This happened in the 70s. There were former officials in the highest levels of the Atomic Energy Commission who didn't like what was going on, so they created their own foundation. They were epidemiologists, and they started conducting studies of people being sickened who lived near nuclear power plants. And what they found was that 18% of the female population in the United States lived within 50 miles of a nuclear power plant. And their epidemiological studies showed that that 18% of America's population of women was responsible for 55% of the breast cancer cases. 55%. Now, the only ways that you can get a rat to grow cancer in the breast is to give it radiation. There's hardly a, a, a toxin that you can give a rat to cause it to grow breast cancer. You give it radiation, it'll grow breast cancer. So that was released. It was sensational because these are former officials of the Atomic Energy Commission that later became the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And so the Centers for Disease Control hired another top gun, and he conducted an experiment. And he did another experiment, and he finally said, you know, uh, it wasn't 55%. According to my calculations, it was 32% of all breast cancers are caused by these 18% of American women. So it was almost, those 18% were almost responsible for twice the, the, the expected amount 
of breast cancers here in this country, even if you didn't accept the 55%, and nobody really cared about it. I'm sorry? Uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s. And the piece of data that the epidemiologist that was hired by the CDC to run his study that was thrown out to bring it down from 55 to 32 percent was arbitrary and capricious. He never should have thrown out a da data point that made the cancer rate actually 55 percent of all breast cancers among these women that lived within 50 miles of nuclear power plants. He just threw it out. For what reason? I just threw it out. Doesn't seem to belong in there to me. <laughs> you don't do that scientifically unless you're bought and paid for trying to bend science. Okay, next study, please. Next sl uh, slide. All right, so we had about 16,500 deaths here from Chernobyl. Again, for the reasons I've already given, infants and those that were elderly and their immune systems were hurting got hit by the iodine and they just died from a common cold or common flu. When Fukushima happened, in the first four months, we saw 22,000 infants die across the country. This data will not be fully seasoned until next year because it takes a while for all reporting agencies to give their data to the Centers for Disease Control. It can take up to three years, maybe a little bit longer. But believe me, Mangano, who's going to present tomorrow, and Janet Sherman, an epidemiologist in Michigan, uh, they will report on it as soon as they have the latest da data. Now, Helen caldicutt has been following us closer. She's a medical doctor from Australia. She's one of the members of the team that got the Nobel Prize for convincing the United States to stop testing nuclear bombs above ground. She has on her website this following information that will be important in a moment that you can die from acute events, acute meaning immediate events, within the first 12 months that looks entirely different from what you may die from 30 years down the road, also from the same exposure to the radiation at the same time, because it can cause genetic damage later, resulting in cancer. It can take up to 60 years for that cancer to, to occur in some individuals. Now, that's fascinating. Because why do some people get cancer within 15 years and others get it at 60? That tells us maybe how to deal with it. What makes that person different and resistant? And that's what we'll be talking about a lot tomorrow. Okay, next slide. Here is the Pekao effect. Here is exactly how it works. Low, low levels of radiation or 100 billion times more lethal than short-term exposures to much, much, much larger doses of radiation because the free radicals that are produced cancel each other out, they make water. Now above these experimental uh, limits here, uh, uh, radiation levels above the, the numbers that were used here, of course, will kill you really fast if it's, say, 400 rems all at once. But within this experimental design, it shows you that the amount of radiation is not linear as to how it will cause you damage. The consensus of scientific groups denies this. This is just one of those things that, that confronted Samuel Weiss when he said to all of his buddies that were delivering babies, would you please wash your hands in between deliveries so you don't give infection to the new baby coming out from the previous baby? And they hassled him so much that he wound up uh, losing everything and killing himself. Now, of course, we maintain absolute sterile conditions delivering babies from woman to woman, and the infant death rate is very, very low as a result of puerperal infection. It took nearly 10 years for the industry to the group of scientists uh, doctors to wake up same thing is true here we are not very good about teaching I have to include myself in this uh, in all honesty old dogs new tricks so you guys being the young generation coming in study the Pacao effect this is the Achilles tendon that 
it has to be a much higher level of radiation to cause you damage, and they almost always talk about genetic damage. This is not about genetic damage. This is about melting like a hot knife through butter the fats that protect and wrap the machinery of your cells away from other parts of your cell. If those boundaries dissolve, your cell dissolves. It's not cancer that shows up. That's what the Picao effect is. Okay, next one. These are just some of the comments that came out immediately after the event. But I'd like to draw your attention to, these are all very authoritative sources. I'd like to draw your attention down to the last one. Dr. Scampa, European Union physicist, who said that if you took a look at just what the lethal doses would be from that radiation if it were put right into a, a number, a, a, lot, a lot of people. Uh, it would be enough to kill 3,000 billion people. And as Stephen Wing says, oh, given enough time, that radiation sooner or later is going to find its way into the food chain. And this is the reason, folks, why chronic degenerative diseases, in my opinion, has been soaring. Multiple sclerosis, the melting of the fatty wrappers around the spinal nerves. Lou Gehrig's disease, something very rare before. Heart disease, Chernobyl heart. Alzheimer's disease, the brain is, most, is a great deal fat. All of these reproductive disorders. The race, the human race will go into extinction mode, full extinction mode, when 25% of married couples can no longer conceive. We're already near 20%, somewhere between 18 and, 15, and 20% is the infertility rate. Next slide, please. Now, here's the real data that came out of Chernobyl. Remember I said that Wikipedia pre-Fukushima reported that only 31 people died as a, as a result of the Chernobyl accident. Thanks to Drs. Yablokov and Nestorenko et al., five epidemiologists from Russia who spent 20 years doing the proper research, going from hospital to hospital, because the Soviets outlawed the reporting of injury from Chernobyl for three years. You faced imprisonment, just like the Japanese have past December. It's now illegal to report ongoings at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. The real rate was just under a million people died over 20 years as a direct result of Chernobyl's catastrophe. But there were 8 million disabilities, and I mean crippling disabilities, disfigurements like you can't even hardly stand to look at of these kids. A gal tomorrow, Katrine, who will be speaking to you, beautiful woman, lived through this, was there. She has an enormous amount of information about how she personally recovered and about what happened around her. So I hope you'll, you'll tune in tomorrow fairly early. Now, this is just for the first 20 years. Remember, these radioactive particles don't go away. Our bodies don't detoxify them. The soil doesn't detoxify them. As you heard from, uh, from Mike Adams, once you use grasses to pull it out of there, it has to go someplace else. And as soon as that's re-released, it goes right back into the food chain again. Hopefully, we'll deal with that more effectively, but we're not. The, the, fe the uh, attempts to remediate the Chernobyl areas have been a dismal failure. They had initial successes, and then overall the failure became clear. They have not improved the territories around Chernobyl or Belarus, even though they get temporary gains. So we can expect a doubling of this stat here sometime over the next 25 to 50 years. OK, next slide, please. Here is the humdinger. <laughs> there were six times more population density exposed to the Fukushima fallout compared to Chernobyl. Six times. And according to my calculations that have only been verified to 3x, there's 7x the amount of radioactive fuel that was disintegrated, melted, and put into the environment. I say seven times. The studies currently show three, 
Immediately after, after Fukushima, they were denying that it was even one times Chernobyl. So they're coming up to three. At least they're coming toward the truth. So what do you get when you have six times the population exposed to seven times the amount of radiation? Is that not a factor of 42? Should we not expect over a period of 20 years up to 40 million people dying from the Fukushima event? Does it make sense now why the Japanese have outlawed their medical reporting and the ongoings at Fukushima? Does it make sense now that they don't want to talk about the bystander effect and the Pekao effect? Does it make sense now why no universities are funding that in either test animals or now that they have a whole group of human beings on human beings themselves? It makes perfect sense to me. This is exactly what David was talking about. So we have cronyism that has taken over not only our government, our republic. Our republic's not a democracy, it's a republic that sure has taken our power away, except for the fact that we outnumber them, as, as you know. If we band together and vote properly and adhere to moral conduct, half the kids going to universities today don't even understand what moral conduct is. They don't get it. Moral conduct is to do yourself no harm and to do no harm to anyone else, to only do good to yourself and to everyone else, and according to your personal resources, serve the greatest good. Who's being taught that today in the universities? The kids are about as narcissistic as I was, but they don't have the chance that I had. They're coming into this earth right now with these kinds of problems and not being fundamentally made aware of the fact that they control this government, they are the government, they can make the difference, but they're not voting together until after they figure out they got screwed by the government. Then they start voting in the way in which reflects reality. We're not doing our job. That's why I'm here. So, all right, thank you very much. I'll take a few questions here. Any questions? Can they come down to the yeah, if you have any questions. Uh... Not out of gas. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I just got here, so I don't know if you've already covered this or not, but uh, you were talking about the re recent radiation spikes in Austin. Could that have anything to do with the WIP facility? Yes, in, in Carlsbad. That's what I think is happening. Uh, it's, it's hard to tell. We think it might because Austin is uh, to the west and 100 miles to the south of the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth nuclear power plant and 100 miles, a little over 100 miles to the north of the Houston uh, nuclear power plant. And so all the prevailing winds should be taking that nuclear uh, uh, waste in the air from those nuclear power plants. It should be going to the east. Don't so we have Austin, a nuclear power plant at the J.J. Pickle facility on 183 and one here on the university campus? Well, uh, the, the official uh, places on the maps that I've seen showed that, because I, I measured out all the known ones that were reported. These are research from facilities. An, oh, research facility. Okay, these are, I'm talking about operational facilities uh, published by the NRC. Well, Austin's in a good position because they're over 100 miles away from those facilities and they're to the west. So the prevailing wind should take most of it all, you know, to, to the to the east, so the 173 counts per minute. Wow, that's a lot, and it it jumps up to three over 300 counts per minute depending on the day over the last few weeks, right? Yeah, correct. could that be coming from the plutonium being released at at uh, at WIP? That's that's short for the weapons storage facility there at Carlsbad, New Mexico. Maybe, but I can tell you this: that the measurements they're they're releasing are actually five times higher than what they're releasing to the public because I we have inf inside information on what that is. I don't know if that helps you. So, so. there are people there that are measuring it. Isn't yeah. it possible to tell from which kinds of specific isotopes yeah, they the are? Yeah, the plutonium is the from? one of, of greatest concern because that's, uh, that's a weapons-grade storage facility and that's where plutonium was made in, in large amounts. And so uh, that's the one that appears to be coming up through the ventilation system right now. And they said yesterday we can expect continuous releases or... or yeah, because they're, once, these, there. once these things start, yeah. they're too toxic to get, get close to. Yeah, they said the filters are too radioactive to test. They're going to say a lot of things. 
And now, you, if, well, if you listen to the DVDs that are coming out of this, you're going to get yourself educated. You're going to realize that, why listen? You listen to the people on the inside like David and uh, Arnie Gunderson and the people who have been kicked in the butt for to releasing the truth, the, the, the real whistleblowers. That's who I get my information from. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, yes, I have, uh, there's a, we have a family uh, friend whose daughter, um, it's like a family of three, and uh, they, yeah, as far as I'm personally um, concerned, they're the closest to Fukushima. They're about uh, in Sendai City, uh, about 60 miles away. Um, and she was in high school at the time and just realized that, uh, actually found this last week or so that she was diagnosed uh, with lymphoma. Lymphoma. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, you could just say, oh, well, you know, how are you going to prove it? And that's what they will do. Right. Understand. Yep. Or, or yep. it's stress yep. induced. Like that's right. Yep. To, that's right. But, uh, um, but uh, it's, I'm just wondering, like with the, the, you know, I think we're at a thousand dollars, a whole genome sequencing. Uh, level of technology, and I think there's big initiatives probably from this year to start sequencing a lot of uh, cancers. Just from a gut feeling, um, do you see that there's going to be a, an area of like, a, I guess you'd call it uh, oncology forensics, where you'd be able to look at how DNA has, you know, like the cancer DNA with the, the individual's whole, whole genome DNA and make comparisons and maybe distinguish between something that maybe is gamma ray based or maybe uh, beta radiation based or something so that you could actually start creating a forensic study. Uh, study. Uh, t tell me your name. Ivan. Ivan. Ivan, let me answer that question because I think I got it. Okay. Uh, what Ivan's asking is, is that if an event like Fukushima happens, would there be a signature in a person who developed lymphoma to say, oh, that came from the Fukushima fallout? And there is a test for thyroid cancer that has just been shown to be airtight. So we have it for thyroid cancer, and it's, I think it's a matter of time before we'll have it for leukemias and lymphomas and everything else. So, so my understanding is yes. Fukushima itself, they, the government would cover medical costs uh, for children, I guess, under 18, um, for all children, basically, because they had no, I guess, no way. Well, they're minimizing they the numbers. Yeah. The right. They're, so. they're minimizing the numbers down substantially. Okay. They are reporting it, but they're reporting minimal numbers. Yeah. And uh, who knows what will happen. I think they'll, they'll follow the same trend that we did here in this country when we didn't report the number of thyroid cancers and underproducing thyroids from the above ground nuclear testing. Right, right. We just let it go and go and go until finally uh, Congress forced the hand of NCI to do the reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing happened with the Soviets. Same thing happened with Three Mile Island. We shouldn't expect anything different with what's coming out of the real medical data out of Fukushima. Okay. Okay. Uh, just right. one quick thing. There is a project also that came out of Japan called SafeCast, yes. uh, which is a bunch of uh, sort of volunteers that are trying to pull together their guide, their Geiger counter readings, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They do have a kit online. Yes. I'm, not, I'm still putting my kit together, but it, it basically allows you to connect it to their servers. Right, and, right. And we have it here called netc.com. You can all look at that. Netc.com is the same volunteer system, and that's the, where the reading was, 173 counts per minute for here in Austin. But uh, uh, Ivan, uh, we need to more scientifically regulate those right. groups. Be, they need to be very, very consistent right. so that it becomes meaningful uh, when we start seeing more increases in cancer. We yeah, can then link it back to the new increases. You get a lot, like a large That's right. of people yeah. uh, putting, putting this data in, and then you can start to look at That's right. That's right. To, so we'll get there. We'll get there. OK, okay. next. Net C, N-E-T-C dot com. Yep, the letter C. OK. Um, a lot of other people just answered a lot of my questions. Uh, yeah, I, I guess, and then tomorrow we're going to be looking at the nutrition side of things. Yes. Um, can, can, I, can I say what we're going to be looking at real specifically, so everyone? We're going to be looking at only four things. Radioactive damage is all about ionizing free radicals called hydrogen peroxide. That's what's burning us. We have systems within us that neutralize hydrogen peroxide. We also then have to remove the radioactive particle, and we have to accelerate the repair that's already been done. So neutralize the free radical uh, hydrogen peroxide. We have systems inside the body that do that. Just feed that system, number one. Number two, take that radioactive particle out as quickly as possible. Now, uh, Mike Adams is talking about neutralizing the incoming from the food. 
But what about the stuff that's already inside the body that you inhaled or already ingested? We'll talk about how to do that tomorrow. That's what we're going to do with the sailors. And then number three, acceler we talked about this earlier. You accelerate that repair system that goes to near quantum speed. We have enough information to know how to approach that so that repair is at unexpectedly fast levels. That can catch us up. So there is hope. There, there is good hope. <laughs> OK. All right, good. Hey. I'm coming from, I guess, the community and regional planning um, discipline. So from my perspective, I hear a lot of the biggest threats are actually overpopulation and climate change. So like in my field, those are those set the tone for all policy and dialogue. And I this is like the first I've really heard a lot about this. So it sounds like you're saying, and I've heard actually I've heard um, I guess underpopulation and things like nuclear radiation are actually a much greater threat. So, or you know, maybe, maybe they are the threat and others aren't, so I don't know. I think, um, what do you think is the reason for that and what do you think should be done moving forward in a policy debate and in, in the science community debate? That's a great question. So um, hopefully that was recorded because that was a beautiful question. Um, David has brought up the issue that I happen to agree with that there is no hope, that we're screwed. It's so broken. But here's why. I want to call that out, and I called it out probably while you were here. We're, our culture is no longer acting morally. We're allowing God to be replaced by the God Almighty dollar. These for-profit over people organizations and institutions are what is running the country through cronyism. How do you stop that? You either help to defund the federal government down to minimums, so it only does what the Constitution said for it to do to protect us with our, with our military in a proper way, but then you have the problem that the military-industrial complex is part of the problem, as Dwight D. Eisenhower talked about, and these people are not acting morally. So we've got to get moral conduct back into our society again, and I'm afraid I just don't know how to do that. Because that's where the breakdown is occurring. OK, any other questions before we take a break? Last question. We got, good. yeah, actually. Um, <clears throat> people listening to this are going to get a pretty dismal outlook because we're presenting what? We're presenting the truth. The truth. Yep. Now, the truth also resides in the ability of what we can do to take care of our own that's right. That's so right. we've got to look to see what we can take care of our own body, how to take care of our own family, mm -hmm. how to take care of our own community. Yes. And frankly, I'm after our own state. That's a republic. Okay. That's what a republic is. Because I exactly. believe that given the size of Texas, that as Texas goes, it could be a model for the rest of the nation to follow. But as close as I can look, I've been very active in my community. I'm getting very active in our state. So mm -hmm. if we can focus to our state but come back to what we can do to our own body. And the best thing that's been hovering around today is talking about the impacts of stress. Well, let me take it a step further. If those of us here learn the powers of bodily regeneration and mind regeneration, yes. because the longest lived cultures are doing it. Yes. They don't start their aging process until they're 90. And if any one of their members is in trouble, all of them are instantly there to help them. Now, we see that in times of ultimate crisis here. During 9-11, New Yorkers out of everywhere were just coming to try to help whatever they could do. We had Marines that were uh, on, you know, off duty that came in from Connecticut, just drove right into the scene. That's when the heart is moved. The National Institute but of we're not Health seeing that even overall. acknowledges that 75 to 80 percent of disease originates from stress or anxiety of those types of factors. Okay, well, let's talk about the cancer part of that equation. The National Cancer Institute says that 90% of all cancer comes from the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. And that's exactly where the radiation is found. To her point, I believe that 80% of all disease is related to the mind. There we go. Okay. Which we but the, have capacity we have to... The, that's the only thing we can really control. Okay, so one last thing. We can't use the powers of the mind over this abomination of nuclear contamination that we're facing. But in order to do a full repair, in my opinion, get that nuclear waste out of the body, prevent re-exposure, and get our heads on by treating our
ourselves and our family and our, and our neighbors properly, and then we can work ourselves out of this mess. It's an integral part. It's, it's the they only go thing together. That we yep. can control. Yep. That's right. And we can control it. And yep. there's hope. There is hope. There's hope. That's the hope. There's hope. <laughs> That's, it's up to you guys. Okay. All right. Here, thank we've you. Got, we've got Akiru and, and Gabriella coming up next for. Yeah. Very good. Okay. They're, they're back at the back there. Yeah. Very happy.